I've been waiting to use this gavel. <laughs> um, so before we begin the business of today, I want to take just a second here to welcome uh, three new presidents who are you. Uh, Judy Sakaki, I gather, is in traffic, but she'll be here for Sonoma State. Uh, we also have now a voting member, uh, student member of our board, Maggie White. Uh, when I say Trustee White, you know which White I'm talking about. Um, and also we have our new alumni trustee, John Nylon. Where are you, John? There you are. Thank you. Uh, welcome to all of those folks. Um, so let's begin. At this time, I'd like to ask Trustee Garcia uh, to please convene the Committee on Collective Bargaining. Thank you, Chair Eisen. Will the Committee on Collective Bargaining please come to order? The first item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of the May 2016 meeting. Uh, is there any objection to the approval of the minutes? Okay. Uh, there being no objections, uh, the minutes are approved. We have one action item today on today's agenda seeking committee approval. We will also hear from uh, the public comments before taking action. The first item is the ratification of the collective bargaining agreement with bargaining unit 13, the California State University Employees Union, SEIU local 2579 will be, uh, this item will be presented by Vice Chancellor Lori Lamb. Ms. Lamb. Thank you, Chair Garcia. Unit 13 employees <clears throat> are a group of English language program instructors at CSU Los Angeles. The program operates as a self-supporting program within the College of Professional and Global Education. As a consequence of CSU Los Angeles moving from quarters to semesters next fall, there was a need to substantially revise the terms of the collective bargaining agreement to reflect those significant changes to the academic calendar. This is a three-year agreement that will run until June 2019. For the first year of the agreement, the parties agreed that salaries would not be increased following the changes in assignments necessitated by the conversion from quarters to semesters. However, in years to amend the leaves of absence with pay article to provide for paid parental leave for instructors consistent with what is provided to all other CSU employee groups. In addition, I would remind the board that this is a self-funded unit and no state funds are used to uh, cover the costs of this contract. Um, based upon that, uh, staff rec recommends rac ratification, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Chair Garcia. Thank you. Um, we will now hear public comment from those who signed up to address agenda items today. Um, we have a number of speakers. If I could ask, I, I will call you up. Um, if I could ask you to um, please, uh, Keep with the time to be respectful of those others coming after you. Um, we have three minutes allotted for each of our speakers today, and I'd like to start by inviting Jennifer Egan, Cecil Canton, and Jonathan Karf to the mic. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Egan, president of the California Faculty Association. I think the analogy between what's happening at the CSU and climate change is an apt one. Neither the CSU nor the planet are charting a sustainable path at the moment. The CSU is facing a series of crises that remain unaddressed. The issues that face us are reaching a tipping point that we may not be able to come back from. I know we're not there yet, and I'm an optimist, even though uh, that might seem um, not obvious to some folks. Um, but I know that CFA is ready to address these issues this year. I hope that we can be unified with the Chancellor's Office, the Board of Trustees, and the Presidents on the campuses to work together on certain goals. We must work together to secure public funding for the CSU system. Though it's difficult to prove a negative, if we were unified last year, we may have had more success securing a better and, a, a better and ongoing augmentation to the CSU budget. CFA has communicated to our friends in Sacramento that one-time funding is inadequate because we do not have one-time students. 
We do not need money to study yet again what all the campuses have studied many times. Um, there is no magic bullet to get us to approved graduation rates. Uh, we know what will work. Significantly alleviating the financial burden on students and creating access to advisors, staff, and most importantly, faculty men mentors who can stick with students through their college career. That's what works. We need human capital. I hope that we can work together to deliver this message jointly and dissuade the legislature from thinking that we and our students are somehow not working hard enough um, when the reality is that we've been starved of resources. I hope that we can work together this year not only to ensure that the raises CFA bargain for 1718 is in the CSU budget, but real and ongoing funding to serve more students, hire more faculty, and restore quality in the budget as well. We must work together to hire more tenure track faculty and more diverse faculty. Um, it is a scandal that our workforce is now 60% lecture faculty. It is insulting uh, to uh, not provide lectures with an institutional commitment and the lack of diversity does not at all match our students. It is also a scandal that funding for the CSU has gone down as the diversity of CSU students has gone up. Uh, these are the issues that CFA will be highlighting throughout this year. Um, lastly, I hope, Chancellor White, that you will reconsider your position on the Ethnic Studies Task Force. Even if you do not take the recommendations as they are, the Chancellor's Office specific goals for campus hiring, if not mandating the continued existence of ethnic studies programs, perhaps you could designate some specific funding to help sustain those programs. California is and should be the leader in anti-racist and social just, justice movements. We can see that acknowledgement in the K-12 systems who have adopted ethnic studies requirements to their curriculum, and I suspect that more, uh, more systems will follow. The CSU is the natural institution to take this lead. Ultimately, to create the sustainability for the system that we're all after, uh, we need to work together. I hope we can do that this year. Thank you. Cecil Canton is not here, by the way. His flight was canceled. Uh, Jonathan Karf will speak next. I'm Jonathan Karf, Associate Vice President for Lectures North in the California Faculty Association and I teach anthropology at San Jose State University. An important cl new clause in the faculty contract between the CFA and the CSU administration is a requirement that salaries for faculty be, be determined before making a budget request to the state each year. It turns out this requirement actually existed in state law that uh, implements the master plan for higher education, but for 27 years I've been teaching at San Jose State, budget requests always came first and bargaining later. That didn't work out very well, and CFA is pleased that going forward, the need to properly compensate the faculty who do the teaching in this teaching university will actually inform the budget requests. Of course, we all know that the process of formulating the 2017-2018 budget is already percolating. We are clear on the funding need for the faculty for 2017-2018, and we are confident that this timing change will make for a better process in which we can all be active partners that funding from the state be the primary source of money to run this people's university. This is another way of saying that we must keep the CSU a public university and not let it slip away, whether quickly or slowly, from the idea of the CSU as a public good. Unlike any other California university, the CSU exists for the betterment and the future of all capable Californians, no matter their background or their wealth. Above all else, this is what makes this university system different. There is quite a lot of talk lately about finding private, private money for the CSU, given the battle scars we've all endured over the last eight years. We know firsthand that it's been tough. We are the ones in the classrooms in direct contact with the students as crisis after crisis has rolled over our campuses. But still we think it is a prof profound mistake to go the route of making CSU more privately funded, even though in the short run it may seem easier. We cannot and should not expect private partners to live up to the vision of the CSU as a public people's university. In fact, it is unreasonable to expect the private business sector to carry the weight of a public university for the good of all. The private sector has its own needs, its own bottom lines. Business can certainly help and has money and knowledge, 
but a public institution is the responsibility of the state and of the public servants who have accepted the task of guaranteeing the future of this public good. In other words, it is the responsibility of all of us in this room, on both sides of this low wall, and of the tens of thousands of public employees who teach, counsel, guide, maintain, and yes, manage on the campuses to ensure that we provide an affordable, accessible, and quality public higher education for the people of California. There is a place for nonprofit private universities in higher education, but there's another place, a special and unique place for the role of the CSU, one with a far greater impact on our future and on the people who would otherwise never have a chance for a college degree. It would be wrong to direct it off the course of being the people's university. And so we in CFA urge you to fight hard for the funding that CSU really needs, even if that may be more than you think we can get. But given a new attitude and a new willingness to move forward together, we can all work to ensure state funding for the future that the CSU really needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like now to invite Pat Gant, Susan Smith, and Rich McGee. Good morning. Um, I'm here today as a president of the California State University Employees Union. Um, and I want to comment on the ongoing changes that we are facing in the university and the world ab abroad. Um, I was pleased to see that it was easier to get into the room today. No badges, no hall passes, and I didn't even bring a bag to check. So it made it a little bit easier. But I also want to uh, heighten awareness again. I've had an ongoing discussion with Chancellor White about the trend in violence in our world and possibly a system-wide approach to mandate active shooter training on all of our campuses. UCLA experienced uh, a tragedy not too long ago and just a couple of weeks ago was the 40th anniversary of um, shooting at uh, Cal State Fullerton where a disgruntled employee came back on campus and took the lives of some employees and some of our members. The world around us is changing and it's becoming more violent every day. It's also not lost on me that basically college campuses were supposed to be a place of sanctuary and, and um, calm and hope to fill for the future become in areas where basically these incidents play out. It's also not lost on me that the shooting and the ambush attack on police officers in Dallas played out on a community college campus downtown. The world's changing. We have to change with it. I encourage you all to think about a more proactive approach as a system and applaud all the individual campuses that have done active shooter training and safety training ongoing. But I think the system needs to step up to make sure that we're all safe every single day. Thank you. And thank you to Unit 8 for your ongoing vigilance and protection of the campus community. Good morning, Susan Smith, Vice President for Representation, CSUU. On behalf of the approximately 15 members of Unit 13 located on the campus of Cal State LA, we are very happy that we were able to ratify the tentative agreement that we reached. We'd like to thank the members of our bargaining team, Nairi Isagolian, Brian Bennett, Joseph Jelensic, and I would be remiss if I did not thank the team from the CSU led by John Swarbrick, including Neha Shah, Thomas Lee, Susie Varela, and most, um, importantly, Dean Eric Ballard of the campus. We hope to achieve the same level of cooperation, courtesy, and efficiency in our upcoming 2017 full contract negotiations. However, as bright as those moments at Unit 13 were, are, there still are many dark spots in our relationships. Um, there is still much work to be done, especially in the areas of system-wide policies, including those regarding outsourcing of our work, especially on the campuses of Channel Islands and San Marcos, and bullying system-wide. It has been almost three years since former Chair of Unit 7, John Orr, and myself spoke to this body regarding the amount of bullying that goes on on our campus, and three years later, we have no measurable results from the system. Um, how many employees on our campuses have been bullied in the meantime? Finally, I need to speak about an egregious policy that has, we have currently been noticed about on the campus of CSU Stanislaus. Um, one of the things that happens is that we get noticed by the chancellor's office regarding policies. While I
where it appears on the campus of Stanislaus in the division of university advancement, democracy and shared leader leadership are being replaced with a dictator, especially in regard with a policy regarding office behavior. Many of the rules in this policy are in violation of our collective bargaining agreement, including ones regarding sharing of information on public calendars, vacation requests, and other items. Um, as an example of some of the other items contained in this policy, you are notified to keep your unscheduled time out of office to a minimum. Every time you leave the office, you are to tell someone that you are leaving, how long you are gone, and when you shall return. You are expected to tattle on your constituents if you hear anything about the division. You are instructed not to interrupt others when speaking. You are instructed to not use the phrase, no problem. You are instructed that you are never to contact the president or any cabinet members at any time. And if you do so, you shall copy the VP and brief them. You shall copy messages to your supervisor on any communication to the campus. And most egregiously and somewhat childishly, this is a direct quote, staff will not refer to senior staff and deans by their first names. We are no longer in 1950. We have a spirit of cooperation and professional behavior towards one another that in the common course of casual conversation, we should be able to refer to one another by our first names. That does not mean that I'm going to refer to the campus president by their first name or the by their first name in an official policy is egregious. I call on this body and the chancellor's office in particular to immediately withdraw this policy. Thank you and ending on a positive note, go Titans because I'm from Cal State Fullerton. Thank you. Good morning, Rich McGee, State Chair Bargaining Unit 9. CSUEU recently received notice from the CSU to meet and confer over the impacts of a centralized no smoking policy. This is a great beginning and we hope to engage you in as many centralized policy discussions as is possible. For the past several years, the state to perform identical work functions at other campuses. Synergy results in both increased productivity as well as substantially reduced cost. CSUEU now calls upon you, the leaders of the CSU system, to demonstrate your commitment to the synergy process by centralizing as many common campus policies as possible, as we are sure that your staff has better things to do with their time. benefit through the Synergy Centralized Discussion process. We look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to more centralized policies now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, I wanna thank all the speakers for making time to be here today and sharing your comments and concerns. Um, we've, we've noted them. Thank you. Um, we will now take action um, actually, I'm sorry, before we take action, I need to open it up. We have the one agenda item, um, the ratification for the bargaining unit 13. Are there any comments or questions from the board at this time? None. Okay, seeing none, the committee on collective bargaining will now take action on the item, which is the ratification of the collective bargaining agreement with bargaining unit 13. California State University Employees Union Local 2579. It's an action item before us. Uh, it, members of the committee only will vote at this time. May I have a motion? Move it. Is there a second? Yes. Hearing a second. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none. The action item ratification of the collective bargaining agreement with bargaining unit 13, the California State University Employee Unions Local 2579 is approved. Chair Eisen, that concludes the business of the Committee on Collective Bargaining. Thank you, Trustee. Uh, Taylor, will you please convene the Committee on Finance? 
good morning, everyone. Uh, will the Committee on Finance please come to order? I would note that no one has requested to address the Committee on Finance during the public comment period today. Therefore, it's time for us to consider today's consent agenda. Um, I would note that uh, approval of the minutes is included in this consent agenda, slightly different than last time. We have two sets of minutes to approve. Now, you might be thinking that's because the Committee on Finance is incredibly productive and hardworking, that we're just constantly meeting and doing good things. Uh, but actually, in this particular case, the minutes from March 2016 were accidentally not voted on at the last meeting, and therefore, we need to approve them today. Uh, for separate discussion. Okay, seeing none, may I have a motion to approve all of the items that are listed on the consent agenda this morning? We have a motion. Can we have a second? We have a second as well. Um, at this point, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Abstentions? Very well. The items on the consent agenda are approved. Um, going on to agenda item number two, it's an action item. It is conceptual approval to develop a sports complex at Cal State Monterey Bay. The item will be presented by uh, Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer Steve Relier, President Ochoa from Monterey Bay, and Robert Eaton, our assist Assistant Vice Chancellor for Financing, Treasury, and Risk Management. Steve. Thank you. Sports complex on the Cal State University Monterey Bay campus. President Eduardo Ochoa will now provide an overview of how this project will advance the campus mission. President Ochoa. Thank you, Executive Vice President Relio. This multi purpose sports and events facility will allow CSUMB to expand its athletics programming while addressing the poor condition of existing facilities. The new facilities would also help attract, recruit, and retain higher profile student athletes to our intercollegiate programs. CSUMB student athletes continue to demonstrate how athletics contributes to student success. In 2015 16, our student athletes managed a GPA of 3.11 and an overall graduation rate of 47%, which is 7% higher than the non student athletes. In addition to NCAA 2 sports, the campus will enjoy expanded facilities for intramural and club sports, as well as many recreational opportunities for the entire student body. The expanded programming will provide opportunities for academic collaboration, particularly in kinesiology and business, and also allow for internships and student employment. The ability to have a state-of-the-art sports and events complex without looking to the system for capital outlay dollars is a benefit to the entire CSUMB community and would provide the needed amenities that our students deserve. In addition, this major facility will provide strong stimulus to the local economy, stimulating completion of the demolition of blighted former army structures and residential and commercial development in the neighboring municipalities. The expanded schedule of ports and entertainment events will enrich the social and cultural life of the campus and the surrounding community, an important feature of mature destination campuses. I will now hand it over to Assistant Vice, President, Vice Chancellor Robert Eaton to provide additional details of the transaction. Thank you, President Ochoa. In late 2015, the Monterey Bay campus was approached by a development team led by BSIX Corp, a group with experience in the development and management of a variety of real estate development projects, including development and operation of sports and entertainment projects with a concept to develop a sports complex project on the campus. Based on this interest, the campus issued a public request for proposals to de develop a sports complex on the campus and B6 Corp, the development team, was the only proposal submitted to the campus. This conceptual approval will allow the campus and Chancellor's Office staff to continue discussions with the B6 development team. However, while the B6 development team has experience with the development and operation of sports and entertainment projects, given the proposed scale and complexity of this project, this conceptual approval will also allow the campus and the Chancellor's Office staff to retain the option of soliciting proposals again and possibly entering into discussions with other development teams if needed. As presently envisioned, the project involves the construction of a new sports complex on approximately 100 acres of campus land identified for athletics and recreational use. Currently, the project is estimated to cost 
$173 million. However, final project costs and date of completion have not been determined. The project will include outdoor athletic facilities, support facilities, concessions, spectator seating and facilities, aquatics, and covered multipurpose athletic fields constructed to NCAA Division II standards. In addition, the project will include classroom and conference spaces, as well as office and administrative space necessary to operate and staff the facility. The campus is expected to enter into a long-term market rate ground lease with B6 or a different developer for a term of not less than 40 years. The project will revert to the CSU upon expiration or termination of the lease. No campus funds will be committed to the project. The developer will be responsible for all financing, planning, design, construction, maintenance, custodial, and management costs of the project during the term of the lease. The developer will also be responsible for all costs associated with environmental and entitlement processes in accordance with CSU requirements, as well as all costs associated with designing and permitting the project. Furthermore, all costs incurred by the campus, including amendment and adoption of its master plan, reimbursement for time and materials during the development project, and other similar costs are to be borne by the developer. Prior to execution of any commitments for development and use of the property, all appropriate related actions and documents, including the proposed key business points of the finalized development plan, will be presented at future meetings for final approval by the Board of Trustees. Chair Taylor, this concludes the presentation. We'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Steve and President Ochoa. Um, members of the committee, other trustees, questions at this time? Trustee Nyland. Thank you. This is probably a basic question, but what happens if this developer or a subsequent <coughs> developer um, become bankrupt and the project is only partially completed? Uh, they have borne all the responsibility for the financing, so there'd be no money uh, that had, would have been committed by the campus. Uh, depending on the terms of the financing, which is one of the things that we will evaluate during the development, the final uh, uh, review of the development plan, uh, it is possible that the finance uh, entities may move in and find a replacement entity to complete the project, <clears throat> or it may be that they would have to foreclose it at their cost. Any other questions from members of the board? Uh, Trustee Garcia and then Trustee Carney. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry, apologies if I'm missing this. It might be obvious, but um, so we, we're going, they're going to pay us for the ground lease. Um, then they will construct these uh, facilities. We will have access to these facilities. So I'm trying to figure out where they what what's in it for them. What are <laughs> so it's because it's a great it sounds great for us, but I'm not sure. Are we then paying them or reimbursing them in any way for use of these facilities? How how does how do they make money? No, I mean this will be this would also be part of the negotiation that we would have as we move forward with the development plan. What would be envisioned is the campus would have it for its use, uh, its own athletic teams, its recreational and use for students graduation, those kinds of things. So they would negotiate with a final developer about time and use availability. In the meantime, the developer will also have third party events that they would hold at the sports complex that generate revenue for the developer and that's part of their management plan. Great, Trustee Carney. Trustee Garcia asked my question, but just one follow up. So who will actually operate the facilities? Who will be responsible for the day-to-day -day operation the final developer in this case if it's b6 if we're able to negotiate with them they would be the ones who are responsible for operating the facility if it's not b6 it would be some other developer in uh as as um, negotiated with the campus and the trustees okay thank you great trustee Kimbell. so um with regards to the student use of the facilities will they be facing char any charges is that something that we that you can answer at this point like say with the aquatics will it be a charge to use the pools or is that just going to be rolled into the what what's available now for student at this point in time i don't envision that it would be students would pay for example under a recreation and wellness type of facility it would pay a fee each year for the use of that Right. Sometimes there are additional usage fees for the facility if that, you know, um, but I don't believe that's been determined yet. I don't envision that. I mean, I don't, I can turn to our staff here. They're shaking no, so I don't believe that's the case. There's going to be any additional charges. Okay, envisioned. so it sounds very much like a 
So the Robert, win, win for us. Yeah, I, I, could I, yeah if I could just add, I mean, just ahead. stepping back a little bit from the, the details, the, the thrust of the last two questions, I think, um, is really what's, what is the business model here that the developer is envisioning? And they see uh, a need in our region for a sports and entertainment complex that would be able to host a whole series of regional athletic championships that currently don't have adequate space. And they see the Monterey area as an ideal location because of the weather and the attractiveness of the region. And they expect to draw a lot uh, of business. Uh, and that's what's attractive for them. And now, obviously, it has to make sense for them economically. So, But they're willing to throw in a lot of uh, benefits to the campus, such as access to the facilities when they're not being used. And we would negotiate with them exactly how much access and what times and so forth. But overall, holistically for them, they're, they're willing to give us quite a few benefits as long as uh, you know the, 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 the business model that they have still makes it profitable for them. Yeah. So that'll be the heart of the negotiating process. I, I would stress to members that this is conceptual approval to allow the negotiation to get into the fine points and it will come back to us, correct, for final approval so that we'll be able to parse it with a with the fine tooth comb and that is make correct. sure that we're comfortable with the trade offs that have been negotiated. That's correct. Great. Other questions on this matter? Okay. Hearing uh, none. Chair uh, Taylor. Oh, yep. Sorry. Just, uh, sure. just to comment uh, uh, to the board, uh, we recall that the uh, Task Force on Sustainable uh, Finances for the CSU brought forth a report to you uh, several meetings ago with a plethora of ideas on how we can crack the way to both maintain our programs and our facilities in years ahead. Mm -hmm. And this is a classic example of a thoughtful uh, win, potential win-win uh, with a public-private partnership that uh, passes the rigorous uh, due diligence that our staff on the campus, Eduardo staff, and in Steve Relier shop do. And we will anticipate more of these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will have a slower rate of development to meet the needs of California. Yeah. Well said. Trustee Kimbell? I'm just wondering, do we have a similar, have we engaged in a similar kind of, uh, you know, a partnership? Are there? Oh, other public-private partnerships? Well, similar, the sports facility. Oh, an athletic facility. Yeah. Great. Um, is the stub? I don't know. The Mystery. stub hub, the stub hub that, center. That's the best that, example of Angus Hills. Similar? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's that'd be the best example that we have right. in the system. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if it's all right, then uh, we'll move forward. The conceptual approval to develop a sports complex at California State University Monterey Bay is an action item before the committee on finance. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion? Okay, a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Very well. The conceptual approval to develop a sports complex at CSU Monterey Bay is approved. We'll now move to item number three. Item number three is a discussion items uh, and an information item regarding the banking, treasury, and investment operations here at the CSU. Uh, members, this is the first of a uh, series of deep dive discussions that we will have at each meeting on the relevant issues that pertain to our business and finance operations. These are really designed to educate us about what we're doing well, where there's room for improvement, and importantly, what additional resources are necessary to ensure that our operations are consistent with best practices. Today, we start with our banking treasury operations. In the future, we'll tackle subjects such as procurement, debt management, reserves, and other really scintillating topics that I know you're, <laughs> you're all really looking forward to. Uh, so with that, let me turn things over to Executive Vice Chancellor Relier and Assistant Vice Chancellor Eaton. Thank you, Chair Taylor. Uh, as uh, Trustee Taylor has mentioned, uh, over the next year, we're going to be uh, in, in the Finance Committee talking about a series of uh, more in-depth presentations. There will be information items on various financial and operational aspects of the university. And today's item will present information on how the university banking operations are structured and managed and how the CSU invests its funds. The university has approximately $4 billion in cash and investments from a variety of sources such as student tuition fees, housing, student unions, continuing education, and lottery funds. And we plan to make another presentation to the board on these reserves and our reserve policy later in the fiscal year. 
Today's presentation on our banking and investment operations will describe how we manage our financial resources to ensure that we optimally utilize and effectively steward our available funds. In addition, an update will be provided at uh, this, this session on the investment legislation that we have been pursuing since the fall of 2014. Legislation that will allow the CSU to modestly increase earnings on its existing base of funds and utilize those additional earnings for capital needs. Here to present this information item is Robert Eaton, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Finance, Treasury, and Risk Management. Robert? Thank you, Ex Executive Vice Chancellor Relier. Uh, organizationally, Treasury operations at the CSU involves three key areas under the ultimate oversight of the Chief Financial Officer. On the ground level are the campuses, each with three types of bank accounts, deposit accounts, paper disbursement accounts, and electronic disbursement accounts, their own accounts payable functions, and responsibility for maintaining accounting records. Campus presidents and campus CFOs, generally speaking the vice presidents for business administration, are responsible for implementing cash management and financial reporting policies at their campuses. Through these mechanisms, campuses collect funds and make payments each day to meet the needs of their students. Campus treasury activity and related financial reporting then flows up to the chancellor's office with all system-wide banking and investment operations under the responsibility of the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Financing Treasury and Risk Management, and all system-wide financial reporting under the responsibility of the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Financial Services, who is also the controller of the California State University. And both of these Assistant Vice Chancellors report directly to the Chief Financial Officer. Generally speaking, cash management at the CSU, that is the banking and investment operations of the CSU, is managed centrally at the Chancellor's Office. We have one banking platform with all campus and Chancellor's Office accounts under one contract with one bank. And we have one system-wide investment portfolio in which we invest funds. While campuses have individual bank accounts to collect deposits and make disbursements at the local level, the system-wide banking and investment relationships are managed and monitored by Treasury operations here at the Chancellor's Office. Centralized cash management provides significant benefits to the system. More efficient use and investment of cash by minimizing the amount of system-wide funds that might be left in bank accounts overnight, thereby maximizing earnings on cash until it is needed for its designated purpose. Lower fees and enhanced services by taking advantage of volume and economies of scale. Stronger ability to reduce risk through the purchase of certain services, standardization of procedures, enhanced monitoring of Treasury policy compliance and control of certain responsibilities and delegations, and then finally, better reporting and overall service. Since 2006, all CSU bank accounts at all campuses in the Chancellor's Office have been with a single bank, Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., under a zero balance or ZBA structure. Under a ZBA structure, all campus and Chancellor's Office account balances are transferred out of each account every business day and rolled up to a single system-wide CSU master account held and managed by Treasury Operations at the Chancellor's Office. Through this process, all balances from all campus and Chancellor's Office accounts are netted against one another to generate one balance in the master account for the whole CSU system. If the balance in the master account is positive, those funds are sent for investment. If the balance in the master account is negative, due to the amount of actual or expected paper and electronic disbursements for that day, funds are pulled from the investment portfolio to cover the balance and ensure that all disbursements are honored. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned that one of the benefits of centralized cash management structure is the ability to reduce risk, and I want to go into more detail on the key components of our cash management controls. The first area concerns the ability to control the establishment of bank accounts and the signers or approvers on those accounts. At each level of the California State University, from the chief financial officer down to the staff at each campus and the chancellor's office, there are a series of controls dictating who has the ability to establish, change, or close bank accounts, who may sign on certain accounts, who may set up or authorize an electronic transaction, the dollar limits associated with any particular authority, and the ability to add or remove certain bank products. The second area concerns bank products utilized by the CSU to reduce risk associated with our banking activities. Products such as positive pay or ACH, ACH fraud filter, and I'd be glad to go into details on those if people want to know, 
or dual approvals for electronic disbursements have been basic parts of our cash management structure for years. Robert, would you go into a little bit more detail on positive pay? Uh, it, it's such a simple concept, yes. but critically important to make sure that um, we're not being taken advantage of by fraudsters out there who want to pass bad checks uh, on CSU accounts. I'd be glad to. So at a campus uh, or the chancellor's office, when they do a check run, they have printed a series of checks that are going to be paid, say, for example, to bit vendors. The numbers of those checks and the amounts on those checks are sent by a file to Wells Fargo. So that Wells Fargo has that information on file when the check is presented for payment by the vendor. Wells Fargo can cross-check the amount and the number of the check. And if there's an irregularity, they contact the CSU, either the campus or the chancellor's office, who can then say, no, that check is no good, do not pay it, or yes, it is good, go ahead and pay it based on some other file information they might have. This is critically important because, as you might imagine, members, um, colleges, universities, governments in general are often considered soft targets for people who pass bad checks. And why is that? Because our systems tend to be a little bit older and creaky. We tend to be a little bit more thinly staffed. And uh, I know at the University of California, almost every single week, we caught somebody trying to use our accounts to try to pass a bad check and steal money from our accounts. Usually not big amounts, $800, $1,200, not the kind of things that would rise to catch somebody's attention at the bank or at the university. But it's a regular occurrence where people will get your account number and try to use that as a way of trying to steal money for our accounts. So positive pay is one of the important, critical safety and security mechanisms that we have to have in place, and I'm glad to see that we do. So a third component of risk control is cash handling and cash management policies, which have been developed, reviewed, and updated over many years based on experience and the adoption of good practice from other organizations. These policies include system-wide policy, as well as campus policy and procedures designed to implement system-wide policy. Now, while not directly associated with banking activity, the use of cards, such as procurement cards, or the use of cards for business travel expenses is an integral part of our disbursement activity, and therefore we have appropriate policies in place to govern their use. And finally, communication within the system, for example, through system-wide affinity groups, is an essential component in risk control by providing warnings to other campuses about attempts at fraudulent activity and the sharing of good practices to thwart such attempts. Now, a natural question would be, are these controls working well? In my view, I believe we're doing a good job, and let me provide you with a couple of data points to support that assertion. The CSU system moves billions of dollars through its cash handling and banking operations each year, and yet over the last five fiscal years, losses stemming from fiscal irregularities associated with cash management activities at the California State University have amounted to less than $450,000, and most of that can be attributed to employee theft or theft arising from employees not following established procedure. And with respect to the use of procurement cards, for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2015, the CSU made purchases through procurement cards totaling about $152 million. However, fraudulent use of the, fraudulent use of the cards amounted to less than $38,000. I believe there are always areas in which we can improve and we must remain vigilant in our efforts to reduce risk. However, I believe these figures demonstrate that day in and day out, staff at the campuses and the chancellor's office are excellent stewards of our cash resources. Funds are invested through the CSU System-Wide Investment Fund Trust, or SWIFT investment portfolio, which was established in July 2007 for the purpose of enhancing centralized cash and cash management and investment management. All SWIFT cash and securities are held by U.S. Bank, the custodian bank for SWIFT. And for investment management purposes, all funds that are moved into the SWIFT portfolio or pulled out of the SWIFT portfolio are divided equally between two investment management firms, U.S. Bank Corp. Asset Management and Wells Fargo Asset Management. All three firms have been selected through a competitive bid process. U.S. Bank Corp. Asset Management and Wells Fargo Asset Management make investments in accordance with CSU policy, market conditions, and through regular communication with Treasury operations staff, which monitors the investment portfolio performance and compliance with policy. Thus, funds uh, are invested for different periods of time based on the forecasted needs of the California State University, with some funds invested overnight to meet immediate liquidity needs and other funds invested longer term until those funds are needed for their designated purpose. 
Now, as Executive Vice Chancellor Relia noted in his opening remarks, we have been pursuing legislation to expand our investment authority, and I want to provide the board with an update on where we stand. Since the fall of 2014, and as, we've, as we have presented to the board at a number of meetings over the last year and a half, staff has been working with key partners in the Assembly, the Senate, the Department of Finance, and the State Treasurer's Office to change the legislation that governs the CSU's investments. Presently, we are restricted to investing in fixed income securities. But because fixed income securities have been generating low returns for the CSU for many years, the goal of the legislation is to provide the CSU with more investment options and increased earnings on its existing base of funds. This potential for additional revenues would enhance the CSU's ability to address its deferred maintenance and critical infrastructure backlog. As a result of these efforts, we have been successful in crafting legislation that meets the needs of the CSU, meets our goals, and addresses concerns expressed by our partners in Sacramento. And key components of the proposed legislation are as follows. First, the legislation seeks to expand the types of, the C types of investments the CSU can make, the most notable of which would be equity mutual funds and real estate investment trusts. In order to move at a measured conservative pace and provide ample opportunity to monitor the CSU's uh, use of the new investment authorities, the amount of funds that can be placed in the new investment options would be phased in by $200 million per year for three years and then capped at 30% of total CSU investments thereafter. The legislation requires the board to establish an independent advisory committee in order to invest in the new investment options. The committee would include a majority of members with investment expertise who are not employees of the CSU. And furthermore, the state treasurer would have the option of serving or appointing a designee to serve as a member of the committee. Reporting would be enhanced with quarterly reports to the board and an annual report to the legislature. And the legislation would codify certain items that are already included in the annual report to the board, such as investment returns, comparisons to benchmarks, portfolio holdings and market values, and then also adds new reporting requirements, such as investment management fees. Because of the importance of this legislation in meeting our capital needs and to insulate CSU's operations from investment volatility, earnings from the new investments would be used for deferred maintenance and critical infrastructure only. The proposed legislation received support from the state treasurer in April 2016 and then passed unanimously in the Senate in late May. The bill is now before the Assembly, where last year the Assembly Budget Committee approved the proposed legislation. In the meantime, staff has started working on implementing some of the provisions of the proposed legislation, notably, notably the establishment of an investment advisory committee to the board and the new reporting provisions. Our purpose today has been to demonstrate the CSU's commitment to managing cash and investment resources prudently and efficiently to ensure that those funds are maximized and available to meet the needs of students. Chair Taylor, that concludes the presentation. We'd be happy to address any questions that you or others may have at this time. Great. Thank you, Robert and Steve, for your presentation. Uh, questions from members of the, the committee or the full board? Trustee Garcia. Thank you. I appreciate the, the detail that you've covered and the materials. Um, you mentioned that there's a competitive bidding process in the selection of the investment firms that yes. we've been using. Um, how often is that reviewed in terms of, you know, how often do you go through like an RFP process? Uh, our regular practice is every five years. Now, with respect to these three groups, uh, that has been pushed back a little in part because of some uh, this proposed legislation kind of on the table, which if it goes through, would then change the kind of funds we have remaining in our SWIFT portfolio. So we didn't want to go through an RFP process, then have legislation and have to go through another one immediately thereafter. So we have pushed that back, but our general practice is every five years. So you would anticipate that if the legislation passes, you would need different types of investment firms, so these would not meet your needs to be included in the RFP? Uh, what I would envision is uh, if the legislation is successful, we would then begin a process to completing uh, the committee. We would then begin an RFP to select um, key partners who would help us manage a new portfolio that would take advantage of these particular new investment authorities. That would be a modest size portfolio. As I mentioned, it was started at 200 million, okay. 400, 600. The existing funds that we have would stay in the SWIFT portfolio at which time we would then run an RFP on that for the management. These firms have done quite well. 
So there's, we're not running an RFP because we have concerns with them, but as a matter of practice and course, we would do it. I would expect that these firms would continue to bid and be possible candidates uh, for final selection. Okay, all right, thank um, you. Trustee Garcia, I think it's important to point out though, as you know, if we're successful in getting legislation passed and signed by the governor, you'll really have two simultaneous paths. Yes, you need to go through RFP to think about this new authority and what kind of new um, managers with different types of talents and skills and experience make sense for us. But simultaneously, the board must and cannot delegate uh, a, a consideration about asset allocation, risk tolerance, and conflicts of interest. We have to make those decisions. We cannot give that to an advisory committee and say, you guys figure it out. That ultimately is our responsibility. And so simultaneous with trying to figure out how to deal with the administration and the implementation thereof, we are going to have to address policy issues, probably at the November meeting, to say, how comfortable are we with that 30%? How much concentration risk are we comfortable taking? Uh, I, I suspect none of us would be con comfortable if all 30% were put into uh, you know, uh, uh, um, IT hedge funds, for example, uh, that are incredibly volatile. So we need to, as a board, and certainly as a committee, grapple with that and give direction to the advisory committee about what we are willing to tolerate. So that'll be going on kind of at the same time. Other questions? I think Trustee Day had his pencil up. Robert, I'm just curious if you've done an analysis on the order of magnitude between current rate of return compared to, say, year one, two, or three, either percentage or uh, net dollars per year. Well, we have targeted, uh, we've kind of expressed in our, with our partners in Sacramento that we'll target a, a return on this new portfolio to take advantage of about 3 to 5%, a couple of percent over the rate of inflation. That compares to right now, we're at about 0.86% on our existing portfolio. So, you know, on a hundred million, you're looking at, you know, a couple of percent, uh, possibly to, you know, maybe 4%. So you're talking at, you know, two to 4 million bucks, uh, something like that as a first year. So. Great, other questions, uh, Trustee Carney and then Trustee Norton. Yes, uh, Chair Taylor, what do you see as um, the process for choosing the Independent uh, Investment Advisory Committee? The, the actual committee members? The committee members. Yeah. Um, we haven't gone so far as to outline a process yet, nor have we identified, frankly, how big the committee is going to be, I believe. Um, I would envision, again, because the legislation says that a majority of them must be um, you know, non-employees of the CSU, we'll first look, frankly, at our, our in, uh, alumni pool for people who maybe are in a position where they've got a great deal of experience um, in the investment space, maybe they're retired now, want to give back to the system, use their expertise. Uh, but these are people who also, we want them to have expertise, but they're going to have to sign a conflict of interest form that says they won't, you know, basically try to use the position to sell things to us as well. That's pretty standard throughout the higher education space. Um, so I would uh, envision that, again, if we're successful getting the legis legislation passed, that um, uh, with your uh, indulgence, I'll work with Mr. Relier and Mr. Eaton and fashion a proposal that we would take to the chancellor to suggest for how that advisory committee should be formed, how many members, how often they would meet, uh, what their responsibilities would be and the like, and then bring that to the board for discussion and approval, perhaps in November. And Chair Taylor, if I may build upon your point, just Please. to let you know, also, we've also reached out, uh, each of the campuses have existing foundations, which have their own investment committees and some investment expertise there. We have already reached out to that on serving on the committee as well. Um, we envision probably a committee of probably nine to 13 individuals, someone in that range is what I envision, so. Great, Trustee Norton. Uh, Robert, a question of clarification. Did I understand you to say that this legislation has been approved by the Assembly um, Appropriations Committee and is now going to go before the full assembly? Uh, no, if I confuse the issue, forgive me. So. The state treasurer gave it its blessing in April. Right. The Senate has approved it completely unanimously uh, right. in May. It's before the assembly right now. It's actually um, uh, in, I think, what they call suspense, and it'll go through the full body later on. My reference about uh, approval of the assembly is last year when we were pursuing this, um, the uh, assembly budget committee approved the legislation. Ah, okay. uh, and then when it went to the Senate, the Senate had some um, some questions about it. So they said, well, we'll hold off. We'll wait a year, get those questions rectified, which we were able to do. Got the Senate over and comfortable. So I only offered up about the last year with the Assembly Budget Committee to kind of give an indication that the Assembly 
has expressed some general comfort with this previously, and so that gives us uh, some optimism. I don't want to jinx it, uh, but uh, gives us you know some optimism that uh, things are looking good with the assembly as well. So, and do you anticipate that the legislature will complete action on it when they return in April or in August? Uh, that's the expectation, and then it, um, my understanding, and there are others who can comment on the process better than I can. It would then go to the governor for signature probably sometime thereafter, maybe in the fall, like September thereabouts. Okay. So right. possibly by the next meeting, we may have a final uh, report to give on the status of the legislation. At September. Thank you. Great. Any other uh, questions from members of the committee or the board? Hearing none. Again, that was an information item. More to come. Let's move to the last item on our agenda today, which is a discussion of uh, everybody's favorite subject, the 2016-17 support budget from the state of California for the CSU. Vice Chancellor Relier. Thank you, Chair Taylor. The purpose of this presentation is to provide information on the trustee support budget request for the 2016-17 fiscal year and the state's final budget decisions related to that requested budget. Of the nearly $300 million support budget request, the state will provide approximately $180 million, which includes anticipated tuition revenue for, uh, from enrollment growth. Assistant Vice Chancellor for Budget Ryan Storm will also discuss other final state budget items that affect the university. Ryan. Thank you. Last month, the state wrapped up its work on the budget for 2016-17. To sum it up, the CSU received $154 million of ongoing state funding and additional $87 million of one-time funding. The following slides include the highlights. Let's begin with the state's decisions on reoccurring or ongoing funding and how those decisions affect the support budget plan adopted by the board last November. This plan lists the components of the board support budget request. Under the column titled plan are the amounts of the new recurring funding that would have been used to support each component of the trustees plan. Because the state did not fully fund the request, you can see under the column titled revised plan, the necessary changes to that plan to align with the actual recurring resources from the state. The CSU plan called for $297.6 million in new funding with no system-wide tuition increases. This was a reasonable plan that balanced the need for reinvest reinvestment in CSU with an understanding that the state economy and tax revenues could plausibly support the plan. A preponderance of the plan assumed new state funding and tuition revenue from an increase in new student enrollment. The board annually authorizes the chancellor to adjust the plan if, it, if expectations change. An example of this would be if state support falls short of the request as it did this year. The final state budget and tuition revenue from new enrollment will provide an additional $180.2 million. To put it another way, for every dollar requested by the trustees, the state is only investing about 60 cents. As a result, we are now faced with limited choices. Let's briefly walk through the components. Beginning with enrollment, the trustee support budget plan established a goal of increasing funded enrollment for current and prospective students by 3%, or about 12,600 students. This would have cost $110 million. Instead, the revised plan commits $57.4 million to support edu educational opportunities for approximately 6,100 students. Next is student success and completion initiatives. Although the trustees requested $50 million, we will continue to invest what we can in student success and completion by adding $10.2 million toward this important endeavor. Some examples include the hiring of new tenure track faculty or enhancing advising services. For the employee compensation pool, the trustees requested $69.6 million and the original uh, plan to fully fund this component of the support budget remains. Next is, is facilities and infrastructure needs. The trustees requested $25 million in recurring funds to address our many maintenance and infrastructure needs. While we had hoped to invest more in our infrastructure, there simply are not enough recurring uh, resources to do so. Therefore, no recurring funding will be set aside for this. Instead, the university will utilize $35 million of one-time funding provided separately by the state for this purpose. We will continue to explore other ways to fund our infrastructure needs and come back to the board with additional ideas. Lastly, for this slide, approximately $43 million will be used to meet anticipated mandatory costs that the university must pay regardless of the level appropriated by the state. 
These costs include recent increases to employee benefits, such as health care premium increases, and operations and maintenance of newly constructed space. Now, this slide shows other notable budget changes affecting the CSU. The state budget includes a one-time appropriation of $35 million linked to a plan to be adopted by the board in September that increases two-year transfer and four-year first-time freshman graduation rate goals at the system-wide and campus level. To receive these funds, two- and four-year graduation rate goals for all students, as well as certain student subgroups, will have to meet or exceed certain benchmarks. A system-wide advisory committee has been assembled to advise the board on this, and you will hear about uh, this later during the Committee on Education Policy. Next is $15 million of one-time uh, dollars for general use that will be prioritized for graduation issue of 2025 and student success related activities. We were uh, only able to allocate a small uh, portion of recurring funding for student success activities and adding these one-time monies to those efforts will be helpful to campuses and students. And as mentioned earlier, the state provided a one-time appropriation of $35 million to address this, the CSU's most pressing deferred maintenance and infrastructure needs. Uh, the notable omission from the uh, state budget was a proposal that would have provided CSU campuses $35 million of one-time what they call cap-and-trade funding for energy efficiency and clean energy projects. In early June, uh, state leaders uh, decided to shelve a final cap-and-trade funding decisions largely because the revenues were significantly lower than estimated. A similar proposal was made last year and ultimately no funding was directed to the CSU. So those were the 2016-17 support budget highlights. As for next steps, the budget cycle begins anew at the next board meeting. Today, as well as during the next two board meetings, it is important to take stock of where CSU stands financially to provide context as you provide guidance and make decisions on many near-term and long-term items. This slide compares state support of the CSU to other state programs. Our starting point is the 2007-8 fiscal year, considered to be the best fiscal year before the economic collapse of 2008. Starting at that point, California experienced two significant cycles. In the first cycle, there were significant cuts made to all state programs during the recession. The second cycle included several years of economic recovery and growth and consequently reinvestment in these, reinvestment in these programs. Very simply and without adjusting for inflation, this graphic shows where funding levels are today compared to where they were in 2007-8. Considering the limited resources that have been provided to CSU since the economic collapse of 2008, you can see here how CSU has fared in relation to other state programs. Another piece of information to consider is shown here. This is a perspective on state funding per full-time equivalent student, or FTES, adjusted for inflation this time. On the left is the state funding high water mark of 2000. FTES. Unlike the prior slide, here we have, have added in two new factors, increased costs due to inflation and the number of students served. Today, we serve 19,000 more full-time equivalent students than we did back in 2007-8. This is equivalent to adding a campus the size of Fresno State since 2007-8. Plus, inflation marches on in both boom years as well as bust years. Consequently, as you can see on the right, the purchasing power of the state's funding levels has eroded to $7,858 per FTES. That is a 19% dip in purchasing power. State budget cuts, inflation, and the size of our student population are, now, are not the only factors we face. Since 2007 and eight, we have had significant healthcare premium and pension cost increases. Tuition, which makes up about half of the CSU support budget's revenue, has been frozen for five straight fiscal years. Couple the tuition freeze with the governor's multi-year funding plan, that modest state investment has more often than not been equivalent to an overall two to two and a half percent support budget increase each year, with, an ex with the exception being 2015-16. We face several other new and emerging factors as well. The economy's growth that has been in recent years, uh, that we've, the, the economy's growth that we have seen in recent years is beyond historical averages, and we are likely facing a recessionary cycle in the near future. In fact, state economists suggest that the economy and resulting state revenues that support the CSU 
will cool in 2017-18 and 2018-19. The state has increased the minimum wage and will phase in those increases over several years, which will have significant direct and indirect impacts on our compensation costs. Also, the CSU is now responsible for meeting all future academic facility and infrastructure needs, which means we must now incorporate this element into our support budget decision-making process. Now, I don't wanna leave you with the glass half empty. Instead, I want to encourage you about the future and the task ahead. While we have significant and serious financial factors that we must manage, we also have incredibly aspirational goals for our students. An objective is that every one of our current and prospective students has an educational experience that is top quality. We want to be able to supply this at the least possible cost to students and their families, and the CSU has and will continue to do its part to be as efficient as possible. In order to close the achievement cap, to do our part to narrow the state's overall degree gap, and to ensure that the Graduation Initiative 2025 is more successful than the 2009 campaign, all of this will require a greater investment and, very candidly, will require more resources. As for next steps, campuses have received their 2016-17 budget allocations, and the budget cycle begins anew at the next board meeting. In September, staff will, bring the board, will provide the board with more uh, fiscal information and a preliminary support budget plan for the 2017-18 fiscal year. We will solicit ideas and feedback from the board, which will be used to craft longer-term strategies and to craft the final support budget plan in November. Chair Taylor, this concludes my report, and questions are welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan and Steve. Um, members, before uh, I ask you to weigh in with thoughts, comments, questions, or concerns, I'd like to turn to Chancellor White. Uh, Chancellor, for your perspective on what this means for this year and uh, the future. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Taylor. Uh, members of the board, uh, presidents, I think, um, you know, on one hand, uh, we always must pause and give heartfelt thanks when we improve. And uh, I am pleased that we have improved our appropriation and for the legislative effort to increase it above what the governor's initial number and in May revised number was. And so to the legislature and to the governor, um, I, I say thank you. On the other hand, we are at 0.05% of the state general fund that happened before that was in place before the recession. This is both unacceptable and unsustainable for us to serve California. And yet, because of the efforts of our faculty, of our staff, of our students, of our presidents and their teams, we have increased graduation rates any way you calculate them. We have increased the number of graduates at the undergraduate and graduate level. We've had record highs in fundraising and research funding, numbers of students, and numbers of faculty. But we are at a point of inflection in our uh, days and uh, years ahead of not being able to continue to serve California in terms of providing as much access as California's future economy needs, as evidenced by a whole host of third parties, including the PPIC, unless we find a way to be more successful to fully fund this institution and allow us to spend the resources that we need to to support our students. You know, I never apologize for CSU students. In fact, I embrace them and quite frankly love them because they come from a place where I came from. And they have all the intellect in the world. They simply just need a hand and that hand varies by student and student to help them stay on their studies, to focus, to learn from our first class faculty, and to get the degree sooner. And in the absence of resources, and you look at the difficult decisions we had to make in order to live within our means again this year, we see that we end up disinvesting in those support services that enable the very students that we ourselves and we are under the gun to get the degree sooner rather than later. So that is our, the nexus of our dilemma the nexus of our opportunity, and will be part of our discussions in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Peter. Very well, well said. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, members, open the floor now for any questions. Uh, Trustee Fagan. Um, so the the uh, comparison of growth or lack thereof from 2008 um, 
little bit apples and oranges in that some are specific institutions compared to generalities. But the thing that uh, I think is a question is why? What's going on? Uh, why is the UC one and a half percent up and we're down? Uh, why are the community colleges up 30 plus percent and we're down? Um, it's certainly not, I would think, for lack of trying. <laughs> certainly, yeah. Chancellor's been banging the drum hard, but at the same time, are you know, is is there some change on our part that could uh, make a difference? Because from looking at that, I think we take away that it's life is unfair from the powers that be, but we could also take away that maybe we haven't quite succeeded at the goal that we've set out and uh, we haven't succeeded as well as some, some of these others. What, what is the answer? Is there an answer? Well, multimedia, maybe if you put slide, uh, let's see, what number do we want to put back there? Slide four back up. Um, I guess the answer is, is twofold. One, it's policy choices today uh, with the amount of money that is, per, is available at the state level, but also a big driver and probably the preponderance of the driver is statutory and constitutional requirements that certain elements of this budget are paid for uh, with the money that comes in. For example, on the K-12 and community colleges side, there's something known as Proposition 98, which is a minimum amount of revenue that comes to the state of California that must be spent on those elements of the state program. Um, so much so that, in fact, uh, when uh, there is ever a recession or a downturn, that there is a requirement that, that the state actually pay back a debt that is owed to those institutions. So you could see a lot of the driving there. Also, with corrections and health and human services, there are some federal issues uh, aligned with that. But ultimately, what I think it, it says is that with the universities, you can see with UC and CSU, as well as around the country, that that is one of the outlets that state governments have in terms of funding their various programs. There are a lot of state and federal statutes that drive all those other areas. And unfortunately, the position that we find ourselves in, like many other systems around the, around the country, is that we are what we call a, discre a fully discretionary investment by the state of California. So that is probably part of the driver now. That, does not, that is not to say that there hasn't been policy um, decisions and budgetary decisions made by the state of California in the last four years where they have proactively invested in us. The governor's multi-year funding plan provided us four straight years of some measured investment. And both the Senate and the Assembly have added to and increased that amount of money. But those are some of the factors that, that create this slide right here. Chancellor White and then uh, Chair Eisen. Uh, Doug, I don't think we could give you a precise answer for the subtle difference between the University of California and the CSU, but we'll do some analytical work on that. It's fairly small. I do want to point out that this slide is uh, without adjustment for inflation, and it is over the course of, uh, do my math here, six, seven, nine years, right? So you adjust this for inflation, you would see that the two university systems are actually negative relative to the 2007-8 position with respect to buying power, purchasing power. So this is a uh, rose-tinted graph. Mm -hmm. And if you put on just steely-eyed white glasses, it's actually negative for yeah. us. Uh, Chair Eisen, you had a question? To appropriations only. We have raised tuition in partial... still well below where we were before the recession. So in total dollars available to pay for the compensation of our faculty and staff and our programs and running our facilities, we are still below uh, in absolute dollars, unadjusted for inflation from before the recession. That delta becomes even bigger. And that's why I come back to my comments about the commendation of our people, uh, but they are one deep and their tongues are hanging out. And that is not sustainable. Right. Other questions for members of the trustees? Uh, oh, Chair Eisen, and then we'll go to Trustee Nylon. Thank you. 
Um, so I wanted to ask about the monies that are being allocated uh, both in our baseline budget and in the incremental budget to student success initiatives. Because as I understand the, what we're facing, we're being asked to uh, increase our graduation rates significantly. And um, we don't know what factors exactly impede students from getting from here to there quicker. Some of them are gonna be within our control, a lot of them are not. Um, and in order to move the needle on graduation rates, we have to spend money uh, and resources on student success initiatives. It's not going to just happen magically. Something has to change in what we are doing vis-a-vis -vis <coughs> these students. Uh, we have to eliminate whatever barriers that we can identify uh, to their uh, graduating as timely as possible. So what I'm seeing and what concerns me is that the very dollars that we need for student success initiatives um, are the very dollars that we're not getting. Uh, and we're not going to be able to increase that would be needed to really make you know, significant change uh, in what's happening in terms of our students being able to complete as timely as possible. I mean, everything we've talked about over the years, you know, summer bridge programs and advisors and high impact practices, and it goes on and on. These are the things that I think I heard one of the presidents say earlier today, we know that these things can work, but they cost money. They all cost money. And uh, if I'm reading uh, from your slide correctly, we're not going to be able to increase the monies that we're already spending on student success initiatives by more than, uh, maybe my numbers are wrong, but 20%, 10%, even with the one-time monies that we would be getting. Is that is that a fair characterization of our situation? If I may, uh, Chair Eisen and Chair Taylor, um, over, since we've been investing in student success. We've invested in 13, 14, $17 million into our, the base budgets of our campuses. And then last year, an additional $20 million. And this year, an additional $10 million is the consequence of the reduction in our budget from the trustees' request. So that is a $47.4 million base uh, that has been built over the last three years, essentially. Is that sufficient to drive the graduation initiative agenda? to success, no. Um, and so I take your point that we are uh, under-resourcing, uh, 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 you know, we're putting in this amount of money and expecting a you know, three or four fold increase in success, uh, but we're making progress, but it is by no means are we able, with all of our fixed costs and operating costs, uh, it really becomes the last, the last dollar. Great, let's go to Trustee Nylon, then Trustee Maggie White, and then Trustee Garcia. Thank you, Chair Taylor. As a soon-to-be recovering budget and finance officer, <laughs> my eyes are drawn to the concept of using one-time funds for ongoing costs. And I, I note that as part of the employee compensation pool. And I just want to indicate that, that uh, uh, especially in the potential of a declining economic environment, is of concern. And I'm sure this is well within policy, but I just wanted to note that. Yeah. Trustee Maggie White and then Trustee Garcia. Well, I'll second what he said. With my four classes in economics under my belt, I have a slight grasp on this. Uh, I actually have a question going back to the funding for our student success and completion initiatives. Is there any way we can pull up that slide that had the breakdown of the ongoing funding? Multimedia, I believe that's slide two. Is this the one you were looking at, Trustee? Yes, yeah, Trust thank White. you so okay. much. So my understanding of this, um, so we have the 10 that's already in our pocket. We've also, this, the 15 million for student success and completion is linked to the 35 million for the grad initiative 2025. Is that correct? Right. Let me explain it in terms of the two buckets. Or there's actually a total of three buckets, but two different ways of receiving mm -hmm. this money. So what you see on the screen here are recurring or ongoing money. So this would be a permanent increase of 10.2 mm -hmm. million for student success initiatives. On top of it, the state provided us one-time money in two different 
pieces. One, mm-hmm. $15 million of one-time money mm-hmm. that we could use for those types of activities, as well as a potential for $35 million more based on um, some work that, that uh, you'll be hearing about later on during the Committee on Education Policy. But that is potentially in play mm-hmm. to be received this year as one-time money as well. But okay. as, as uh, Chancellor White already explained, we have for the last three years been able to invest some permanent ongoing money for student success initiatives. And now we're able to augment that a little bit with some one-time money here as well. Right. Thank you so much. So we have the 10.2 and we also have the 15. We're waiting to receive the 15 when we receive the 35. We would receive the 35 dependent on work that uh, right. we will be doing as well as uh, the, the blessing by the state to, re- to release that money to right. us. And so when we receive the 35, that's when we receive the 15, or we already have been granted the 15 for that one time 15 funding. is already uh, to the CSU. Okay, thank you so much. That's what I needed. Great, Trustee Garcia. Um, Chancellor, uh, Chancellor White, you mentioned that so far to date, we've invested 47 million uh, for the student success, but that's not enough. And I, I definitely agree with that statement. Do we have a sense today of what is enough? Like, so how much do we need if we, you know, to meet the goals that we have for ourselves, you know, even if we just look at what we've targeted for 2025, not looking at the more aggressive uh, graduation rates that are being asked of us, but do we have like a fixed budget number that we should, that we're looking at? The, the, the work, uh, tr- uh, Trustee Garcia, thank you for the insightful question. The, the work of the graduation uh, 2025 uh, initiative 2025 group that will be coming to the board for ratification, if you will, and acceptance in September. We'll finalize the sort of numbers we th- numbers with respect to our rates, and I suspect that we'll have also at that time a rough estimate of what type of personnel and programs and their costs will be associated with meeting those targets in the out years. And so I think we'd be in a much better position to answer that in a quantitative or at least a semi-quantitative way in September. And we will uh, send it to the chambers uh, uh, so you can be aware. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very well. Um, any final questions from members of the board? Um, if not, in that case, uh, Chair Eisen, this concludes the business of the Committee of Finance. Thank you, Trustee Taylor. I think you got a couple bonus points there in terms of the timing. Uh, Trustee Morales, will you please convene the Committee on University and Faculty Personnel? Thank you, Chair Eisen. Will the Committee on University and Faculty Personnel please come to order? Uh, No one has uh, requested to address uh, this committee of the University and Faculty Personnel during the public comment uh, today. Um, The first item on today's agenda is the approval of the minutes of the May 20th, 2016 meeting. Is there any objections to the approval of the minutes? Any corrections, modifications? Being none, the minutes are approved. Uh, considering that we'll be taking uh, uh, a couple of votes, uh, we'll have a couple of action items uh, later in this committee uh, meeting. I want to uh, go through the names of the trustees that are members of this committee besides myself. Is there's uh, uh, Trustee Melendez de uh, Santana, uh, Trustee Obrego, who is not present, uh, uh, Trustee Day, Trustee Fagan, Trustee Christenberg, Trustee Garcia, Trustee Nyland, and Trustee Norton. Uh, so uh, we have, there are two information items uh, and two action items in today's uh, discussion agenda. Uh, item one on the discussion agenda is an information item regarding executive transition programs. Vice Chancellor Lamb will present this item. Lori. Thank you, Chair Morales. The CSU gains value by providing opportunities for leaders to continue their service in different capacities through various board approved executive transition programs. In the past, trustees provided for the transition of leadership with a trustee professorship. This was replaced by the Executive Transition Program and later the Executive Transition II Program. All of these Executive Transition Programs provide a period of transition for individuals who separate from their executive position. The executive must have served five years as as an executive at the CSU, be in good standing, and not accept non-CSU employment. As reported in the agenda item, effective July 1, Dr. Ruben Armagnana moved into the trustee professorship program, and Dr. Zing, Dr. Paul Zing, moved into the executive transition program. Effective August 8, 2016, Dr. Richard Rush will also move into the executive transition program. 
As you may recall, a detailed report of all transition programs is in place is provided to the board at a later date, typically in September. This is simply the required notification of these three new individuals entering into the programs. Trustee Morales, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Lamb. Any questions on the board? Okay, uh, item number two of the, is, uh, on the discussion agenda is an information item regarding the 2016-2017 compensation pool for unrepresented employees. Vice Chancellor Lamb, will you present this item? Thank Lord. you again, Chair Morales. Today I'm updating members of the board on the 2016-17 compensation pool for management personnel plan and confidential employee groups. These are the two principal employee groups that are not represented by unions. Under the terms of our various collective bargaining agreements, the majority of our represented staff employees will be receiving a 3% general salary increase on July 1, 2016. Our represented faculty will be receiving a 5% general salary increase on June 30th with an additional 2% on July 1, 2016. Previously, the board had approved a three-year compensation plan for MPP and confidential employees that mirrored the general salary increases negotiated with our principal staff unions, a 3% general salary increase in 2014-15, a 2% general salary increase in 2015-16, and a 2% salary increase. A Following the recent resolution of the California Faculty Association negotiations, the CSU has subsequently entered into various memorandum of understanding with our staff unions to augment the previously negotiated increase of 2% for 2016-17 based upon the fairness clauses. However, Chancellor White has determined that fiscal prudence requires that, be, that there be no change to the MPP and confidential compensation plan. As such, for 2016-17, Chancellor White is implementing a 2% compensation pool for eligible management personnel plan and confidential employees effective July 1, 2016. For informational purposes, this 2% increase is below the rate of inflation for the period 2015 through 16, which is 2.2%. As the purpose of this item is to inform you of Chancellor White's decision, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Lamb. Are there any comments or questions for anybody on the board? Okay, we'll move to item three. Item three is an action item seeking committee approval on executive compensation. Chancellor White will begin followed by um, Trustee Fagan and then Chair Eisen. Chancellor White. Uh, thank you, Trustee Morales. I'm now making recommendations to for board approval of compensation for 18 campus presidents, three executive vice chancellors, and two vice chancellors. The five new campus presidents are not being included since they just started or will start in the near future. The recommendation regarding the vice chancellor and chief audit officer will come from the chair of the committee on audit, Doug Fagan. I know that you share my belief that recruiting and retaining high quality leadership faculty and staff for the CSU is important to the short and long-term health of our enterprise and is critical to the overall success of our students and our system. I recommend a 2% compensation increase for these executives effective July 1st, 2016. As you know, most of our employee contracts have been settled with increases ranging from 2% to effectively 7% for faculty. And as you just learned, I've implemented 2% for other unrepresented employees, including management personnel plan employees and confidentials. The 2% proposed for the presidents and the executive vice chancellors and vice chancellors is in line with the board's approved three-year plan for compensation, which included 3%, 2%, and now again, 2% for this last year. This is the third year of that plan. And with respect to our system executives, we have stayed within the board's plan. I further recommend application of the 2% across the board for all executives where I have authority to do so. The total cost of the 2% increase for all executives is within the trustees budget and amounts to $160,185. Members of the board, I'm asking for your authorization to implement increases for our system executives as outlined in the meeting materials. Trustee Morales, that concludes my report. Thank you, Chancellor White. I now turn the matter over to Trustee Fagan. Trustee Fagan. Uh, thank you, Trustee Morales. Um, 
So I've been asked to um, recommend a 2% compensation increase for Vice Chancellor and Chief Audit Officer Larry Mandel, who is, uh, I, I believe, uh, very uh, deserving, but I hadn't had a chance after uh, just getting this uh, information to uh, make sure that uh, there's no concerns or questions by other members of the committee, since I'm uh, supposed to be doing this on behalf of the committee. So the committee is uh, still made up of uh, myself, trustees Garcia, Kimball, uh, Morales, and Simon. And so any, anyone who wants to say anything, this is the time. I'm sure we all support uh, Larry in his good works. And we'll hear more about that uh, when we talk about the audit committee later today. So therefore, on behalf of the Committee on Audit, I would also recommend a 2% compensation increase for Vice Chancellor and Chief Audit Officer Larry Mandel. It is important that Vice Chancellor Mandel be compensated in the same manner as other system executives and also for his, his, uh, his good works. So members of the board, I ask for your approval of the salary increase for Vice Chancellor Mandel and Trustee Morales. That concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Fagan, and I as a member of that committee support support that uh, definitely. I'll now turn the matter over to Chair Eisen. Thank you, Trustee Morales. I come before the committee to recommend a compensation increase for Chancellor White. I recommend an increase of 2% uh, along the lines that we have just uh, discussed for everyone else. Uh, this is 2% of Chancellor White's total compensation and it's based upon his leadership of the system over the last year. Members of the board, I ask for your approval of the salary increase for Chancellor White. Trustee Morales, that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, item, agenda item three, the compensation for executives is an action item before the Committee on University and Faculty Personnel. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion for, to approve? Is there a second? Okay, move and second it. Any discussion? Um, any, any, uh, all, all in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes. Uh, item number four is an action item seeking committee approval regarding an exemption from post retirement employment waiting period. Vice Chancellor White Lamb will begin by, uh, by um, presenting this uh, on the case of President Cooley. Uh, uh, Ms. Lamb? Thank you, Chair Morales. On September 12, 2012, Assembly Bill 340, referred as the California Public Employees Pension Reform Act of 2013, was signed into law by the governor and became effective January 1st of 2013. This new law provided various retirement related changes that impacted new current and retired CSU employees. Under this law, retired CSU employees are subject to a 180 day waiting period before returning to work as a rehired annuitant. There is an exception to the 180 day waiting period if it is necessary to fill a critically needed position and the appointment has been approved by the governing body of the employer. This is the second time we've asked the board to take action under this new law and if approved, waive the 180 day waiting period. We do this only because of the exceptional circumstances involved in this particular case. We always strive to comply with the retirement provisions, but in this case, we believe it is in the best interest of the CSU to ask this employee to continue to serve CSU prior to the normal 180 day waiting period. I would also like to mention that there are no significant economic impacts to the decision before you. First, the employee involved, for the employee involved, there is no impact on his retirement. He will be obligated to still work within the maximum hour requirements under CalPERS, generally part time. For the system, we will certainly bear the cost of paying the employee to work part time for us during the transition period. However, as President Coley will further describe, we could not find someone to work and pay full time for the services that this employee can provide for us on an interim part time basis. With that, I would now like to turn the presentation over to President Coley. Thank you, Lori. Former CSU Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer Dr. Benjamin Coulion served as the Acting Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Administrative Affairs at Cal Poly Pomona since September 2015. He retired from state service on June 30, 2016. In July 
2015, the Lanterman Developmental Center, a 287-acre parcel, was transferred by the state to the CSU for use by the Cal Poly Pomona campus. In March 2016, the CSU received the State Historical Preservation Office's Historic Resource Assessment Report for the Lanterman Parcel, which determined that significant portions of the property were historic in nature, subject to potential development limitations, and could pose substantial and costly prohibitions to its future use and development by the university. Given these possible impediments, the CSU subsequently re-engaged with the Department of Finance and requested an extension of the deadline to notify it of the CSU's intent to keep or relinquish jurisdiction of the property. The Department of Finance has agreed to an extension and requires notification no later than September 1st, 2017 of the CSU's intent regarding the Lanterman site. Driven by increasing fiscal constraints, the fact that the original campus footprint is more and more limited and the looming deadline of September 1st, 2017, Cal Poly Pomona has a critical need to develop strategies to optimize use of this potential resource and assess its impact both within and beyond the current academic process of assessing the impact of the historic resource assessment report on Lanterman. The magnitude of analyzing the site for future use over the next 30 to 40 years with projected build-out costs that could easily approach $1 billion requires a depth of expertise, negotiating sophistication, and experience that Cal Poly Pomona simply does not parcel, Dr. Quillian was also working with the president, the campus community, and the CSU in evaluating options for the potential development of an additional 150-acre site known as SPADRA. Dr. Quillian began to address these two complex resources by retaining the Urban Land Institute to conduct two technical assistant panels. The TAPS will assess the land use opportunities and challenges for both Lanterman and Spadra sites. We expect the first TAP results in July 2016 for the Lanterman property and the second TAP in August 2016 for the Spadra site. Utilizing the information gained through TAPS, Dr. Quillian would then solicit major commercial developers nationally and perhaps even internationally to submit requests for proposals to explore potential public and or private partnership possibilities. It is also critical that Cal Poly Pomona explore projects and resources which might become available from federal, state, and local agencies compatible with Cal Poly Pomona's educational mission. Given the unique experience and skill sets required of these projects, Dr. Quillian's knowledge and expertise are needed during the ULI assessments and beyond. In addition, his relationship with academic affairs and in particular the College of Agriculture and their external representatives from the agricultural industry will be critical in determining the best uses for SPADRA compatible with current fiscal demands and academic need. In addition, the campus has lost a key staff member whose responsibilities included oversight of the Lanterman site and the arrival of the new vice president for administration is not expected until August 1st. Momentum critical to the successful exploration of both the Lanterman and Spadra initiatives will simply be lost without Dr. Quillian's continued leadership. The Cal Poly Pomona campus expects to require his skills and talents at least through July 2017. The importance and need for his transitional service to the university requires that Dr. Quillian be employed as a rehired annuitant before the passing of 180 days following his retirement date. Trustee Morales, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, President Coley. Uh, 
Uh, agenda item four, the exemption from post retirement employment waiting period is an action item before the committee on university and faculty personnel. Only committee members may vote at this time. May I have a motion, please? To approve. So moved. Okay, so moved. Is there a second? Okay, moved and second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion passes. Um, Chair Eisen, this concludes the business of the Committee on University and Faculty Personnel. <coughs> Thank you, Trustee Morales. Uh, we have been so efficient that we are now able to take on one more committee prior to our lunch. Uh, so, Trustee Farrar, will you please convene the Committee on Committees? All right. Would the Committee on Committees please come to order? I note that no one has requested to address the committee during the public comment period today. It is now time for the committee to consider today's consent agenda. All of the committee items requiring full board approval are listed on the consent agenda. Would any committee member wish to remove the item for separate discussion? All right, seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The items listed on the consent agenda are approved. And Chair Eisen, that concludes the business of the Committee on Committees. Sorry it took so long. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Farrar. All right, we can convene uh, or disconvene for lunch. Uh, now we will uh, be back in this room at 1 o'clock sharp for our uh, audit committee. Um, work. Thank you, everyone. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's